Okay, assalamu alaikum everybody. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Welcome to, to another amazing session. We are now starting on our 80th surah, Surah Al-Nur, which is so exciting and so special. And I think we got a hint of that yesterday um, when Sheikh talked about um, the parable of light upon light in the khutbah, which was absolutely beautiful. At that point, we actually didn't know that that was the surah that we would be covering, but several of us, when you know, when we heard that in the khutbah, we were like, hmm, I wonder if that means Surah Noor is coming. And sure enough, alhamdulillah, that's, that's what we ended up with. So um, I'm so excited for that session. Um, I just, um, I wanted to talk a little bit, I, I wrote about this in my weekly email, um, but for those of you who maybe didn't see it, um, you know, I wanted to reflect a little bit um, in the aftermath of my critique of Hamza Yusuf last week. I mean, people know that in the last two sessions, my first session, I had not listened to the entire um, conversation, but I heard enough to feel like, oh, you know, that was a little bit of a disappointment. It was a lost opportunity because Jordan Peterson and Hamza Yusuf both have a huge audience, and clearly there are people that were interested and, and open, not necessarily supportive, but open to trying to understand more about what Islam was. And I was disappointed. And so in the last halakha intro, I, instead of just sitting as most of us do and complain, oh man, I didn't like that. He should have done this. He should have done that, whatever. I felt like, you know what? do something about it. You know, put your money where your mouth is. If you don't like it, then why don't you offer an alternative? And so that's what I did. And of course, I knew that by doing that, um, that that would open the door to a lot of criticism because certainly, you know, I've gotten a lot of criticism because, you know, I sit next to Sheikh, I don't wear a scarf, you know, and all these kinds of things. So, you know, I just, I wanted to reflect on just this, this notion of, of speaking out because, um, you know, clearly we've learned here in the halakha is that part of our duty, part of our right, but our duty is to testify. And especially when we feel like something is not right, that, you know, that is actually what our religion calls for. That's what God calls for. And I felt like it was important. I felt strongly that, you know, okay, I think that he could have answered with better answers. And so what I wanted to do was then actually, you know, contribute something to the discourse and help essentially provide an alternative bridge to Islam and the Quran that I felt was appropriate because, you know, when I speak to a non-Muslim audience or a non-specialist audience, I feel like you have to start building bridges by things that are intuitive and common ground that you can relate to um, just as a human being. And so it was important for me um, even to start with notions of love and trying to disabuse things um, that people normally associate with Islam. So, um, of course, you know, I was expecting that it would be um, controversial, and I was right. We actually, we did get a lot of, um, you know, people that came to, to, you know, watch the video on our YouTube channel. Um, the, we, we cut, you know, that section of it that I did, and I think we have close to 5,000 views, which is a lot more in a week's time than we are used to getting. Um, and then, you know, certainly there are a lot of people that commented. And, you know, a lot of the comments were, were you know, not particularly nice, um, but I, you know, I was expecting that, and um, and that's fine. Um, you know, that's, that's part of the cost of speaking out, and it's not something, you know, as I wrote about, that should um, dissuade people or make them, you know, feel afraid. Because, you know, when I believe that when you are serving God and that you feel something in your heart, um, you feel like you can contribute, that you absolutely should. And so I thought I would just sort of, Reflect on that because, um, you know, nothing that I said in my conversation was at all negative or I think even all that, you know, special. It was really um, something that was trying to, again, open a bridge for people to understand about God and the Prophet Muhammad and, you know, the prophets, uh, Muslims, love, you know, everything that I felt people could respond to. But it was interesting the, the types of... Um, the negative feedback that I got. So just, you know, to give you sort of a range, um, you know, of course people you know, were like, how dare you speak when you don't have a hijab? You can't, you know, how can you speak intelligently about anything when you don't even know sort of the basic, you know, commandment about, you know, for women is you have to cover. Well, I've spoken obviously about hijab a lot in this space, so I would encourage people if they're interested to go back to that. Um, and that how dare I speak because I'm not a scholar. Um, and, you know, separately, I think, you know, one, I, I, I always say that up front, no matter what I say about Islam, I always say, you know, this is my opinion, I'm not a scholar. But, you know, part of what my what I was trying to do also is to demonstrate the power of this education, because, you know, in counting the hours, we have all actually been here 
more than 500 hours, you know, in these halakas in the last two years. And that's just for Project Illumin. I mean, I, you know, have been a longtime student of, you know, of the sheikh. And so, you know, my learning from him goes back decades. But if we just count the amount of hours that we here have spent in going chapter by chapter, 79 surahs, 500 plus hours, and that's a conservative estimate, that's a lot of learning. And a lot of what I said was intended to be sort of like the best, you know, the, the essential, like what would I share with people who knew nothing about Islam? And so, you know, that was important. Um, some people were like, what is this stuff? You know, you're talking about love. That's just that BS about Rumi. It's all Rumi. What is this? You know, which I, to which I thought, oh my gosh, okay, if you don't think Islam is about love, then I think, you know, it's important for you to relook, you know, your assumptions and your education. Um, we were accused of being a CIA channel, which was interesting. Um, and, you know, I also got mansplained about how it would be really good if I would say, peace be upon him, after I reference, you know, Muhammad, or that I should, um, you know, when I refer to Hamza Yusuf, that I should refer to him with a title. So I should refer to him as Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, not just Hamza Yusuf. Um, and I was told to go get an education because basically I know nothing and that I shouldn't be speaking. So, um, you know, and people were like, I hate this channel. You know, I don't like, you know, Khalid al Fadl. So, you know, it's like there was a lot of stuff, but there really was not a lot of engagement with necessarily the content and substance of what I was saying. And so it made me really think like, Okay, you know, I know social media is very toxic and people love to take that opportunity to just, you know, like start fights and things like that. But honestly, like as Muslims, you know, we are commanded in the Quran to speak kindly. And, you know, we are supposed to actually, you know, be happy when people are wanting to learn about Islam. And it's our job to try and make that bridge, make that opening as welcoming and beautiful as possible. So when you have someone who is trying to do that, you know, I, I really had to wonder, okay, what is the purpose of writing really mean negative comments? And as a Muslim, it's like, okay, you know, if you don't, uh, if you want to engage me on what I said, I'm very happy to have that discussion with you, you know? And if you liked what Hamza Yusuf said and you were fine with that, well, fine, that's wonderful. Um, but if you don't like what I said, why the negative comments, you know? And a lot of them were just ad hominem attacks. They were just mean things that were said about me. So it's like, okay, so are you trying then to just, you know, crush my spirit or, you know, shut me up or, you know, mansplain to me um, or, you know, whatever. And I think that that is just a really um, intriguing, important and sort of sad statement of our priorities. Because fundamentally, the vast majority of people who are really unhappy were most unhappy that I dared criticize Hamza Yusuf, someone of his stature. They were more unhappy with the fact that I didn't like how he answered those questions and I actually did something about it and offered an alternative instead of just complaining and saying, you know, someone, why doesn't someone else go do something? It's like, well, you know, I decided to do something about it. And then I was upset that like, okay, you know, as Muslims, shouldn't we be happy when people try to offer alternatives? Because not everybody is going to understand Islam in one way or another. And if you can contribute to the conversation, then you absolutely should. And you know, YouTube is a public forum. If you didn't like what I said, then please, I encourage you, create your own video, you know, add to the conversation, bring other people in a way that you think is appropriate. But when people get so bent out of shape because I dared criticize Hamza Yusuf, I think that that is a really important indicator of where our priorities are and I think that that's something that deserves a lot of reflection. So, um, you know, again, um, I wanted to hopefully, you know, tell people that, um, you know, whether you are actually speaking out in public or whether you are just, you know, speaking to someone in private, someone, a friend or whatever, I mean, this is obviously our duty as Muslims to testify to the truth and testify to the best of our ability. And that I, you know, as we learn in these halakas that if you are on the side of light, if you are on the side of truth, God knows your intentions. And I do believe that God will be with you and that, you know, that is something that, you know, you never go wrong by doing something that you truly in your, in your heart believe is right and that you're doing for the sake of Allah. So, um, it was interesting also when, when I, you know, was told like, oh, you know, I told Sheikh about this, um, people were upset because I didn't say, you know, peace be upon him after I said Muhammad. Sheikh was like, well, you know, that's between you and your God. And then the point about um, the not referring to Hamza Yusuf as Sheikh. Well, my reaction to that is, listen, when Hamza Yusuf is um, ready to start calling out and speaking in public about all of the evil and the abuses that the UAE 
um, is committing against Muslims, and he actually starts, you know, like standing up for injustice where he should should be standing up. At that point, I'll think about referring to him as a sheikh. So I think that's the only appropriate answer to that. And lastly, you know, um, I mean, so I want to say again, I mean, th these are just, you know, indicators, but I got a lot of really, really beautiful, kind, supportive comments. And for that, I'm really, really grateful because, you know, a lot of times when you're speaking out into the wilderness, you don't necessarily know how people are receiving it. And so for everyone who wrote, you know, really loving, beautiful responses, I thank you so much because they, they meant so much to me. Um, and then, you know, I always feel like um, God has a way of sending certain messages at certain times, sort of dropping them as gifts. And so right before preparing um, for this introduction, there was a really beautiful comment that was posted on YouTube, and I thought I would share it. Um, so in response to uh, the excerpt, uh, my, my converse, or my, my presentation last week. So, um, Salam, I have been a Muslim for the past 10 years, and in my search for knowledge, I have encountered lots of mainstream Muslim speakers, and I genuinely believe each of them are right in their own place. But if I had to judge between them as to who has summed up Islam for me in its most best and pristine form, I would say it's Grace Song. It's my bad that I had judged her and compared her to the professor, but the fact that she emanates so much beauty and knowledge shows the effect of embodying Islam on each individual is different and unique and beautiful. Your summary of Islam actually moved me to tears, most probably because in my search for truth, I have struggled to harmonize Islam with my inner self, which always said, irrespective of what I read or hear about Islam, it is um, God's religion. If it is God's religion, it must be beautiful, as God is beautiful, and you just proved my inner belief to be true. Thank you for being part of my journey. Um, Thank you so much for that beautiful message. It's on YouTube. Um, and all I really have to say about that is, honestly, it's not its not me. It's this education. And I really have the sheikh to thank because everything that we are getting exposed to and the beauty and, you know, the, the depth and the sophistication of this message is truly life transforming. And I wouldn't have been able to say any of the things that I said without this project, Illumin Journey, nor with the journey that I've shared with him over the last decades, um, because through the education and the living example and just seeing you know Islam and how it plays out and how it's normal and beautiful and intuitive that has been life-changing for me so I'm super grateful that I was even able to do that and I you know I invite people you know if you're just getting to know us just coming upon us to, to really engage with this learning because it's it is truly life transforming and um, you know, with all the darkness in this world, um, you know, we get messages from people all the time, um, people who feel lost, people who feel, you know, they had a bad experience, they don't understand, you know, and they're, they're just seeing that there's something beautiful here. We have to go back to the fundamentals. We have to go back to what the Quran says. We have to understand, like, what it means. That is, like, how we find our way back. It's clear after 79 surahs um, and 500-plus hours that this is the way back for, for us as Muslims. And so I truly believe that with all my heart. And um, so I hope that people will, will continue on this journey and, and stay with us. Um, so thank you, everyone, again, for your time and for your support. Um, and inshallah, I'm looking forward to an amazing session. Surah Al-Nur. Yes, <laughs> it's going to be great, inshallah. So, okay, thank you so much. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Subhanallah al-Ali al-Azim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salam ala Muhammad. خاتم الأنبياء والرسل أجمعين المرسل رحمة للعالمين وعلى آله الميامين وعلى أصحاب المختارين وعلى من اتبعوا بإحسان إلى يوم الدين اللهم اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل عقدة من لساني يفقه قولي so, um, إن شاء الله um, Today is Surah Al-Nur, and um, there's no question it's a weighty Surah, and um, the challenge of, of um, uh, uh, the challenge of the journey with Surah Al-Nur uh, is, uh, is formidable. Um, so let's um, start as we normally do, and that's with the history and um, 
situating Surah An-Nur and then go from there to the uh, message. So, in terms of transmissions, um, there are a number of transmissions that say that Surah An-Nur was revealed uh, after Surah Al-Hashr. Um, Interestingly enough, uh, some transmissions say that it was revealed before, right before Surat al-Hajj, which is in, uh, not likely. Uh, it could have been revealed after Surat al-Hajj, that's possible, but right before Surat al-Hajj, um, not likely. We, we know that because of a specific historical incident, we can situate Surat al-Nur um, or tie Surat al-Nur to a specific historical incident, and that's Ghazwat um, Banul Mustalik. And we've already talked about Surat al-Munafiqun, which also was revealed at the occasion of Ghazwat Banu Mustalak. And if, um, uh, if you recall, Banu Mustalak is a, a, a tribe um, close to Medina, and this is because it, it will be important in unpacking Surah Al-Nur to understand that this is after the Battle of Uhud. Um, whether Banu al-Mustalaq is um, before the events of Surah Al-Hashr, the events of the evacuation or the expulsion of Banu Madir, uh, whether it's uh, after, shortly after or shortly before um, you know, it's not very clear, but Clearly, that Ghazwat Banu Mustalaq is in close proximity to the events of Surat al Hash, uh, the, the expulsion of Banu Nadir. And um, uh, as we know from Surat al Munafiqun, Ghazwat Banu Mustalaq is also known as Ghazwat Marisa. Um, Banu Mustalaq was after Uhud, like other tribes that were um, allies to Quraysh, or allies to Mecca, they thought that invading Medina might be um, an easy task, that they could raid Medina or invade Medina and pillage um, Medina, and that because at the time Muslims are seen as in a vulnerable state, and we've mentioned that the Prophet ﷺ had a very effective intelligence um, system. Um, consistently making sure that he is receiving information about the tribes in the vicinity to know what they are up to and having re intelligent having received intelligence that, that Banu Mustalik plan or are organizing to invade Medina um, the Prophet ﷺ organizes a preemptive strike against Banu Mustalik 
catches them by surprise, which ends up being a very important element in, in the battle. Um, and Banu al-Mustalaq are defeated. And if you recall, when we talked about Surah Al-Munafiqun, I, I believe it was Surah Al-Munafiqun, we talked uh, also about um, um, uh, the story of, um, what was her uh, name? Um, Huh? No, his uh, the prophet's wife, the the woman that the um, Juwayria. Yeah. The uh, we talked about his marriage to Juwayria and this whole, and so this is around the same events. And the important thing is what Surat al Nur is very famous for is the events that took place with Aisha is that Aisha accompanied the Prophet ﷺ in this ghazwa. And as the practice was back then, is that there is something called the Hawdaj. Hawdaj is, a, um, is like a compartment, um, curtained compartment that is placed on the back of a camel that women travel in. And you, if the the curtains are pulled, you you actually don't see the person traveling inside the haudaj. And that after Muslims were re leaving the um, uh, the battlefield of Ben al the compartment, the haudaj that Aisha was in. People thought that she was in fact in her haudaj, that she was sitting in her compartment, and so they took off. But as the narratives go, that Aisha had dropped a necklace, and she left her haudaj to go look for the necklace, and didn't realize that they left without her. And uh, in fact, and that uh, hoping that they would realize that she's not with them, that she's not, in fact, in her haudaj, uh, she stayed put in place, I mean, which is a smart thing to do because if you go around traveling in the desert, um, it's quite dangerous. But she, she sat in place and waited for a number of hours. Um, and at this point, a man who was a Muslim, it, we are not sure why Safwan, his name was Safwan, had um, stayed behind. What? Why was he traveling by himself? But whatever the reasons, the man sees Aisha sitting and asks her what's going on, and she says, you know, they left without me. And so he tells her, well, I, you know, rather than sitting and waiting for them till they discover their error, which who knows could be for how long, uh, ride with me and I'll take you back to Medina. So this is the event that leads up to what is known as Hadith al-Ifq, which we'll talk about. But the importance of this is that it historically situates Surat al-Nur for us. So we know that it was the events of Surat al-Nur where um, right after Ben al-Mustalaq that it was tied to this, um, the the uh, Aisha be, being left behind and then given being given offered a ride back to to Medina, which she accepts, and from a man with um, 
what we know about Safwan ibn Mu'tal is that he was, um, what we know about him is that he was a man of good character. I mean, there was there's nothing untowards that reaches us about him. Um, okay. There are, I mean, there are, there are always these sort of, um, interesting historical is issues that often uh, it's, it's very hard to uh, very hard to just go around them um, and if you're being very conscientious in your research it's, it's hard to avoid them so we know for instance that Ghazwat Banu Mustalaq is in the third to fourth either the end of the third year, or uh, Hijri year, to beginning the fourth Hijri year. But so many reports tell us that Surat al-Nur was revealed, uh, in fact, according to these reports, that the, it, it's revealed at the end of the fifth year or the beginning of the sixth year. So it's a mismatch because if if the events of Surah An-Nur is is tied with the the uh, this particular battle or this particular campaign, the Banu Mustala campaign, then that's the third or fourth year, which would mean that it the, the Surah An-Nur would have been revealed before Surah Al-Hash, not after Surah Al-Hash. But nevertheless, we get these reports that tell us that no, it was Surah Al-Hash, then Surah Al-Nur, and that it was the fifth or the sixth, end of the fifth, beginning of the sixth year, which doesn't jive. I mean, if you just, doesn't work. It, is there were a way to resolve this? Um, the simple answer, or the most straightforward forward answer, is that in the all likelihood, in all likelihood, Surah Al-Nur uh, is before, revealed before Surah Al-Hash, and that because the evidence that Surah Al-Nur was in fact revealed around the events of the campaign of the Panu Mustalaq, that Surah Al-Nur was revealed in the end of the third Hijri year or beginning of the fourth Hijri year, and that it is not true that it was revealed at the end of the fourth Hijri year, beginning of the, sorry, at the end of the fifth Hijri year, beginning of the sixth Hijri year, as um, some have reported. I think even Muhammad Asad writes in his tafsir that he accepts the, the reports that say that it was revealed uh, at the end of the fifth Hijri year and beginning of the sixth Hijri year, which, as I said, doesn't make sense. It's hard to reconcile. Now, as we will see, Surah Al-Nur has a, a fascinating structure. And what it does, um, in my view, Allahu A'lam, Allah knows best, but in my opinion, failure to understand Surah Al-Nur as a structurally coherent surah, to take the surah in its totality, and to understand the message of the surah in its totality, can lead to misapproaches or um, faulty approaches to law because the structure of the surah is fascinating. It begins with law. It has like the, the structure of a pyramid, if you will. It begins with law. It peaks with the 
focus on the concept of light, luminosity, enlightenment, and its opposite. Then, after it peaks with the addressing the notions of enlightenment, it deals with what has been referred to as Dala'il al-Tawheed or um, Dala'il here is not evidence but indicators of the unified nature of divine truth and the immutable nature of divine truth and the way that existence itself testifies testifies for God or testifies na nature points to God um, and and after that, then it goes back again to dealing with specific positive law. So it has this pyramid structure. Law, then ultimate truth, if you will. So truth beyond the law or transcendental truth beyond the law. Then it returns back again to the subject of law and then closes with that. And dissecting the surah or taking, taking it apart and extracting what it says about law and separating it from what it says about illumination and enlightenment and what it says about creation in fact will end up defeating the very purpose and the very trajectory of the surah that in order to understand what it's saying about law you must understand what it's saying in light of what Surah An-Nur is saying about enlightenment and about An-Nur al-Ilahi or the light of God and what it's saying about darkness and understanding why it has this pyramid structure where the center of the Surah is the enlightenment and the edges of the surah like the uh, like the the edges of a pyramid are the specific laws why does it why is it structured that way and understanding that is critical for understanding the very objective of the surah and in fact as we will see surah to nur itself alludes to the fact that it is revealed it's as if Allah is saying and in fact Allah is saying not as if but Allah is saying I know that I am revealing this surah to you at a time of great anxiety and extreme insecurity I know that and as we will see there are reports to that effect where, where people actually talk to the Prophet ﷺ about how stressful life is, that how what they're going through is so stressful. We'll talk about that. And Allah addresses this and says, you know, 
Allah is fully aware of how challenging the circumstances that you find yourself in are. Allah is fully aware that you are living under an an, an inordinate amount of stress and pressure. But don't think that while Allah is telling you about how you manage your lives and the place of enlightenment vis-a-vis how you manage your life is separate and apart from how stressful or how you should deal or treat or navigate the stress in your life, as we will see. So, it's again, it's, it is mind-blowing. If, if you understand how texts spoke about law, how texts spoke about kingdoms, how texts spoke about power, how texts spoke about warfare or sovereignty or domination or dominion, including pre-modern religious texts or, you know, biblical texts, but even uh, texts from non-biblical texts like the Zoroastrian tradition or at least what was reconstructed of the Zoroastrian tradition or um, surviving texts of Hammurabi or, the, or, or so on. The, the structure of Surah Al-Nur and the message of Surah Al-Nur is mind-blowing. Um, as I often say, a human being doesn't speak that way. A human being doesn't talk about issues in this fashion. You lose that if you break Surah Al-Nur apart and you take what it says about um, fornication and separate it from what it says about uh, modesty or separate that from what it says about um, asking permission to enter a house uh, and then you separate all of that from what it says about God being the light of the heavens and earth uh, then you you in fact lose that sight of how singular and unique this kind of discourse under the circumstances that Muslims confront. So we're going to walk through this pyramid. We're going to start with the laws and talk about all the, the, the various issues, reach the peak of the surah as it, it talks about illumination and enlightenment and the nature of darkness, and then go back and talk about the laws, and then sum up that pyramid structure and what it then conveys to us and what it tells us about what God is telling us about Medinian society and the normative implications of that, or the normative lessons that transcend Medinian society. Okay. So, first, we know the incident that so many traditions, so many reports tell us were instigated or sparked Surah Al-Nur. Um, that when Aisha travels back to Medina, 
and people see that she is not in her veiled compartment in the, in the haudaj, um, and in fact she's riding with this man Safwan. Um, it's a striking image. Where is Aisha when people arrived in Medina? She's nowhere, but then she shows up riding with this man alone coming, and she says um, that, well, why are you riding with Safwan? She says, well, I left my haudash to look for a necklace that I couldn't find, and you guys left without me, and I found myself stranded, so I accepted a ride. Immediately, there are people that think the story is rather ridiculous. You dropped a necklace, so instead of alerting anyone around you and saying, I can't find my necklace, stop, let's go look for it. You just left your haudach by yourself and went out in the desert. You didn't think to tell anyone. And furthermore, the necklace itself is not of gold or silver. It's worthless. So many people, including Hassan ibn Sabit, thought this, is, this adds to the absurdity. Your necklace is worthless. So why would you go looking for a worthless necklace and everyone knows that if you are traveling in a caravan, on especially in a military campaign, don't you have the sense to know that you, you don't go anywhere with, without telling someone? This is, you know, this is not uh, a place where there are highway highway patrol and police cars and nine one one. This is the desert. This is a very dangerous place. And, of course, we already know from all the sources that we studied that there is already is an, an existing um, rather eager, rather unpleasant um, the opposition party, the munafiqun. Remember, these are the people that withdrew in the Battle of Uhud. These are the people that supported, that promised to support Banu Nadir and never came through. These are, this is a real opposition group. And they jumped on the occasion. Oh, not only is Muhammad bringing all the insecurity and all the, 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 the political problems that he brought to us, not only did he bring all these migrants and these refugees that we have to take care of, but on top of that, his women are loose. He can't control his women. And what is this story about a necklace, this is absurd. The likelihood is that she had a romantic rendezvous with Safwan. If it was just the munafiqun that said that, it might have not bothered the Prophet والسلام, so much. But because the munafiqun were constantly uh, running the rumor mills, and saying the, the, the most nasty things about the Prophet والسلام, and his family. And th so that's not the, it's surprising. But um, when you find, and, and Abdullah ibn, ibn Ubay, by the way, plays a, a critical role in this as the head of the, of the hypocrites, uh, he becomes quite animated about, you know, oh, we, 
what is this? We have to defend our honor, and we can't allow this. Our, you know, Muhammad, who's now our leader, to to have his women being loose and doing immoral things, um, uh, and demanding that Muhammad take a firm position vis-a-vis -vis his wife. Prove to us that you are a real man, a real Arab leader. Well, by disciplining your wayward wife, your wife who left the Hawdaj without permission and, and says, I went to look for a necklace, we don't believe this story, do something. Well, what is the something that the hypocrites wanted? Well, they wanted him either to divorce Aisha or to beat Aisha or to uh, lock Aisha at home, imprison her at home. Uh, and, of course, they were aware of what Surah Al-Nisa had said. And remember that Surah Al-Nisa said, bring four witnesses if you're going to accuse your wife. And say, well, this is, this is proof that this doesn't work. Look, you know, now Aisha is going to be an example for our women. Women are going to be going off in the desert, coming back with men and coming up with stories. It, 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 the, the, you already have an economic problem in Medina that we've talked about. You already have external threats in Medina that we've talked about. You already have a committed opposition group in Medina that we've talked about. And on top of all of that, now the hypocrites are starting to get leverage among Muslims who are saying, wait, yeah, at a minimum, why doesn't Muhammad interrogate his wife? All he's done is he listened to the story and said nothing. And when people who are actually among the Sahaba, meaning people who were close to the Prophet ﷺ, like Hassan ibn Sabit, who is the poet of the Prophet, and uh, uh, there was a man called Mistah bin Athatha, uh, who was also among the, and, and Mistah becomes, also, as well as Hassan ibn Sabit, among the people who are at a minimum. They're not saying that we believe that Aisha, but they're saying at a minimum, the Prophet should take a firm position by either divorcing this woman or you know taking a stand to show that he can discipline his his wives uh, and there was also a woman called Himna um, Himna bin Jahsh Himna who is also uh, among the companions of so not at all one of the of the of the hypocrites uh, uh, but Himna as well sort of considered this an issue. So everyone is talking about the, the and everyone is has an opinion. You know, those who actually believe that Aisha was up to no good, those who believe that, well, we don't know if Aisha was up to no good, but at least the Prophet should divorce her, those who believe the Prophet should interrogate her, those who should believe the Prophet should take a, a firm position that expresses displeasure with her judgment calls and also the other victim in this whole thing is Safwan himself, the man who gave Aisha a ride. Safwan himself becomes quite depressed because of the rumor mills. And note, and this is something that is often dropped when we, when we tell the story, What it is not just about, it is not about whether people liked Aisha or didn't like Aisha. That's not, in fact, most people didn't 
wouldn't have, she was young, she was quite young. Uh, she was known as a, uh, as the, you know, the, 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 an energetic um, woman that w was often would appear in public uh, was the Prophet ﷺ. Um, but when a society is under a considerable amount of stress, political stress, economic stress, it is very easy for a society to find a distraction in what we call backbiting. To the, the, instead of talking about, you know, whether you're going to be invaded by Quraysh tomorrow and find your whole family murdered, or whether, and as we will see, the, the, in fact, the entire Jazeera Quraysh was forming alliances that made Muslims feel that they were existing in a very hostile environment, as we will talk about. And already the economic difficulties that Medina is, uh, which we've talked about in Surah Al-Hajj, that Medina is experienced in Surah Al-Jum'ah, and so it is very easy to do what human societies often do, and that is to distract yourself in gossip, gossiping about people, and especially gossiping about uh, public figures, in this case, the Prophet ﷺ and his family as a leader, as a representative, and what he does or does not do with his family, and what he should do and should, or should not do with his family. And there's another aspect that is also important, very important for Surat al-Nur, that societies often, when they are under a considerable amount of stress, political and economic, they'll take out their frustrations on women. And as we will see, that their, the, the attention becomes directed at gossiping about what this example already we know from reports by Omar and others that, and we've talked about this before, that the, the men of, the Meccan men, the men of Mecca, they, when they go to Medina, they find that the practices, the habits of women in Medina are rather liberal compared to the customs and traditions of Mecca. And Umar, as Umar ibn Khattab is, is reported to have said that, you know, in, in Medina, we, in Mecca, we used to rule our women, and we came to Medina, we found that women ruled their men. And this manifests itself in a number of tensions um, between the cons relatively conservative expectations of the refugees, of the migrants, the Meccans, and the relative, relatively far more liberal norms uh, regarding women in Medina. Who Women in Medina are not aristocratic women. Unlike the women in Mecca, they're not accustomed to living in in closed compartments and being served by a great deal of wealth and a great deal of servants. Women in Medina are working women. They're accustomed to being working women. And so the norms in Medina are far more open about women and the role of women. And we saw this, for instance, when in Bay'at al-Aqaba, when several women 
are among the representatives of Medina that go and pledge an allegiance to the Prophet ﷺ. We saw this in the involvement of Medinian women in several military campaigns. And part of this, part of the, the gossip that goes on is the Prophet ﷺ is seen as endorsing the public role played by women. So the Prophet ﷺ refuses to, be, to prohibit women from, um, uh, from attending Jum'a, refuses to prohibit women from joining campaigns, refuses to prohibit women's, women from attending public meetings, and in addition to all of that, emphasizes that women have the right to be educated, that women are, the, because right to education means also the right to access. And all of these are part of the social tensions that exist, especially at this early Medina period. And at least for people like Hassan ibn Sabit, who it, we'll talk about what, what happens with, with Hassan ibn Sabit and um, uh, was Mislah um, a bit later. But anyway, for at least people like Hassan ibn Sabit and Mislah ibn Athatha, Some of what is reported sounds like, well, look, you know, this is what we end up with. The, the, you know, because the, the prophet didn't train in women when we came to Medina, um, we end up with scandalous events like this. So it's not just a matter of an accusation of zina. It's a scandal. But it is a scandal with political implications. It's a scandal that is, has compli complicated um, connections to the hijra, to the role of refugees, to the clash of culture between Mecca and culture and Medinian culture, to the role of women, to a, a, a number of layers. And I'll show you, you know, how this plays out in a second. Okay. And we know that the Prophet, ﷺ, maintains his silence. Although, you know, Aisha is the daughter of one of his closest companions, Abu Bakr. And so it's a very uncomfortable situation. Um, Aisha herself is indignant. And in fact, she is not apologetic about her decisions. And... Um, it, responding to her father, responding in, 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 in uh, she is, doesn't think that she should defend herself. And there is a famous dua uh, that Aisha is reported to have repeated consistently during this period. Um, ya sabigh al naam ya dafi al niqam. يا فارج الحجب الحجب يا كاشف الظلم يا أعدل من حكم يا حسيب من ظلم اجعل لي فرج ومخرج. The dua is, I mean, it's difficult to translate, but it's basically a dua that says, "I complain to you, God, you God who is 
the one who can repel injustices, the one who can lift darkness, the one who is the true recourse to the victim of injustice. Uh, my complaint is to you, God. Make, create a way for me out of this predicament. So Aisha is, is you know, report, and as we also know that after a month when Surah Al-Nur is revealed and um, the, clearly vindicating Aisha, uh, and Abu, Abu Bakr tells Aisha, get her, you know, go thank the, the prophet. Go thank your husband. And she says, no, I won't thank him. I thank God. Because she's, as I said, she's rather not apologetic. She's actually angry that the, in her view, that the prophet, alayhi salatu alayhi should have support her, supported her even more clearly rather than um, maintaining Sort of a, it, it, I mean, it's a, it's an interesting point, right? Because he, he doesn't accuse her, he doesn't even question her, he doesn't even blame her for the decision. She doesn't say to her, "What are, are you crazy? Why did you go look for it? Why didn't you tell someone?" He doesn't do any of that. But what he does, he's clearly unhappy about the political exposure that this incident created. And we, there are reports that he seeks the counsel of those who are closest to him. He, that he talks to Umar ibn al-Khattab, that he talks to Ali ibn Abi Talib, that he talks to key individuals that are close to him. But I have to tell you that, for instance, there is an, a tradition that says that Ali uh, tells him, uh, well, you know, no one would blame you if you divorced her. There is a, a, a lot of reasons to suspect the authenticity of that report. Um, Did this event affect Aisha? Absolutely. I mean, did it did it bother Aisha, and did she remember it for the rest of her life? She refers to it repeatedly in several events later on in her life, so it's clear that it was. But from her perspective, she wanted unequivocal support. You know, an unequivocal defense which from her perspective, uh, her father failed to do, her, the Prophet ﷺ didn't do, and some of the other companions, leave alone someone like Hassan ibn Sabit who actually plays a role in um, accusing her or criticizing her. But anyway, that... When Surah, so the, the the story that when Surah Al-Nur is revealed and she's vindicated, the, the the famous tradition where you know Abu Abu Bakr, her father, tells her you know thank your husband, and she says no, I will not thank my husband, I thank God um, for the vindication. Okay, so all of this is just the context of what is known as Hadith al-Ifq, the um, the scandal about. And if means the lie, right? The scandal of the lie. And the lie is those who accused Aisha of having done something improper, not just Aisha, but Aisha and Safwan, of having done something improper. And the surah opens up Suratun and Zanaha, Wafaradnaha, and Zanna Fiha, Ayat in Bayinat in La Alacum Tadakarun. So the very first verse, Muhammad Atsa translates, Isura 
is this which we have bestowed from on high and which we have laid down in plain terms, and in it we have bestowed from on high messages which are clear in themselves, so that you might keep them in mind. First, the word surah itself is a name ism limanzilat lilmanzila sharifa that it is a name for an honorable or honored status. The reason we call the chapters of the Quran Sur, so we don't call the chapters of a book Sur. We call the chapters of a book Fusul or Fasl for singular as a chapter. But the reason that the chapters of the Quran are called Sur is that they are a, each chapter is supposed to be an honorable thing, something of great honor. And so, when Allah starts out by saying suratun and zannaha, Allah is, it's, it's like, um, It's like underscoring that what I'm going to deliver to you, what I'm going to tell you, is something of great importance. It's something that deserves great reverence and considerable reflection. Now, with, with the, the, that expression is that we've followed the shape means to make it mandatory. So it's like, it's, again, it's like telling you, pay very careful attention because this is normatively a very critical mandate. Now, وَأَنْزَلْنَا فِيهَا آيَاتٍ بَيِّنَاتٍ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَذَكَّرُونَ So, this revelation that is coming to you is of great relevance, great critical importance. It is of, of great normative implication, faradnaha. But pay attention in this revelation to the fact that revealed in this revelation are ayat, Signs of reflection, indicators, pointers to the divine. لَعَلَّكُمْ تَذَكَّرُونَ So that you may remember. Now, commentators like Razi and Zamakhshari and some others, but certain commentators, notice this. And said, when it comes to law, normally Allah doesn't tell us, doesn't use the expression tadakkarun so that you may remember when Allah talks about law. Normally, when Allah talks about Allah, Allah will say something like, لَعَلَّكُمْ تَعْقِدُونَ or لَعَلَّكُمْ تَفَكَّرُونَ so that you may reason. So you may reflect. But here Allah says, so that you may remember. And to Razi's credit, and Zamakhshari, the, the two most prominent examples here, is that they noticed 
that because Surat al-Nur is much more than just about law. It is, now this part is from me, not from Razi. It is as if Allah is saying, if you take the surah and you just understand and you just take the positive legal commandments, you will fail to remember. In fact, you'll fail in the in in heeding the objective and the purpose of the surah. In order to heed the objective and the purpose of the surah, you must cut you must absorb and digest the part where tazakkur is relevant, where remembrance rather than reflection is relevant. And what are, what are the parts that are consistently Allah tells us or Allah refers or alludes to in terms of remembrance as opposed to reflection? There are the parts about the innate luminous nature of God and what the nature of light and darkness and how that light and darkness is within us. It is primordial, primordial, primordially within us. And we either remember the light or we forget the light. We either recall what is innate within us or we fail to recall it. And you will see how this, the law, connects. And so why Allah begins by, by although Allah is going to talk about law, but Allah doesn't use the tafakkarun or taqulun, which is the norm. But uh, instead Allah uses tadakkarun, which is remember. Now, note, just so you, you uh, I said that Surah Al-Nur came in the context of even gender implications. And you see evidence of this if you look at some, you know, any of the of the well-known tafsir among the ahadith which is not an authentic hadith by I mean clearly so but among the ahadith that were um invented and circulated in the context of Surah Al-Nur is a hadith attributed to Aisha herself which says لا تعلموا النساء الكتابة وعلموهم الغزل وصورة النور Don't teach women how to write but teach, uh, teach them غزل, uh, weaving and teach them Surah Al-Nur this surah and it is of course when you see uh, this goes to the issue of hadith methodology when you see a hadith like that of course there are i mean it, they whoever circulated the, this hadith didn't do a good job in inventing a good chain of transmission because the chain of transmission is already not um not very intelligently put together but when you see reports that circulate like this in the context of a surah, like Surah Al-Nur, where evidence of these gender tensions exist from the historical record, you the, the circulation of hadith like that then is further indicator of the ramification of gender tensions. As we will see that because Surah Al-Nur, again, we, we, we often just forget or lose touch with how to understand history. This is a woman who exercised an autonomous decision, a decision that many people would say is unreasonable.
it was a decision that, according to the norms of the society, was radical. Going off looking for a necklace without telling anyone, not telling the 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 uh, the guard the people who are guarding the guarding the caravan, not telling the driver of the camel, not telling any of the people that she could have told, not even telling someone, sending someone to look for the necklace, or even forgetting about the necklace, as Hassan ibn Sabit said. You know, who cares about a necklace that is, doesn't, is not worth, worth anything, but it mattered to her. Taking the autonomous decision to go and look for the necklace, which ends up putting her in considerable danger, ends up, Allah saves her from that danger by sending this kind man, Safwan, who gives her a ride. And when all is said and done, when all is said and done, she's vindicated. Remember, the Prophet ﷺ refused to accuse her and refused to interrogate her. And the revelation comes and says, as we will see in a second, not only is she right, but anyone who dared say anything deserves punishment. People understand the historical implications. You know, you don't sit with the mind of, 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 a, of someone in the 21st century we Muslims, because our history is colonized, we, 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 we no longer understand the, the significance of things. That, that's the impact of colonialism on us. The import of that was, by all measures, absolutely radical for the medieval world. You're talking about women empowerment? Well, in what ways does this empower women? When a woman exercised what seems to be an unreasonable and an irrational decision, and then Allah comes and supports her, and as we will see, even punishes those who criticized her. The import of that was understood by people at the time as, oh my God, now women folks are going to be out of control. How are you going to control women after this? And that is why you find a hadith like this circulated, attributed to Aisha, which I mean it's. But this is the the art of delving into history, not from a colonial perspective. From the perspective of a loyal native, a loyal insider who is trying to understand the historical moment as lived by those who experienced it. Not to serve a political agenda, but to understand the unfolding of events. So, That first verse in Surah An-Nur, if unless you are a hypocrite, unless you are among the, the hypocrites who, you know, their ears and hearts are closed, you realize that Allah is saying, I'm going to tell you something extremely important. Pay attention. Because if you don't get this lesson, as we will see what Surah Al-Nur tells us about what the consequences are, because if you don't get this lesson, what is at risk is istikhlaf fil ard that in fact you cannot claim to represent God on earth, which is, as we will see, I mean, it, 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 again, it, it blows one's mind if one truly understands what the Quran is doing. Um, let's take a five minute break. I, I've, I've tired myself out, so let's just take a short break. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. 
So, the beginning of the surah, by the way, the, um, I believe it's Razi that says with the, the first ayah, لَعَلَّكُمْ تَذَكَّرُونَ أَيْ تَتَذَكَّرُوا دَلَائِلِ التَّوْحِيدُ وَتَطَّعِزُونَ بِالْحَقِّ وَالْبَاطِلِ um, that, that's the language that so so that you may remember Tawheed the truth of about Allah's unity and singularity and uh, that you may reflect upon Al Haq truth and bottle and what is wrong. Anyway, okay. So then the first Azania was Zani. Fajludu Kulu Wahid in Minhuma met at a jelda. Walata Hudukum Bihuma Rafa. Fidin illa in Kuntum to Minun, Bilahi Walyom il Akhir. Walyash had other Bahuma Taifatun Min and Muminin. The very first salvo decrees a punishment for zina. Now we we know that zina in, in doesn't differentiate. Zani is is refer is the word that refers both to adultery and fornication. And in Surah An Nur, the punishment or it specifies a hundred lashes for people who commit fornication or, 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 or adultery. Um, and, well, let's use the translation. So, okay. Flog each of them with a hundred stripes and let not compassion, compassion or uh, you're feeling sorry, sorry for them. Keep you from carrying out this punishment. If you truly believe in God and the last day, and let a group of the believer witness their chastisement. Uh, but witnessing the chastisement is that it doesn't necessarily mean that the punishment must be carried out in public, but it does mean that a group of people representative representative of the community sort of a uh, the idea of a witnesses who are your peers or the peers of the um, the accused witness the carrying out of the punishment and we know that and this is a larger issue, but we know that in Islamic law, Muslim jurors differentiated between fornication and adultery and said that for fornication, the punishment is 100 lashes and for adultery, stoning till death, which is the biblical, traditional biblical punishment. Among the um, the the early schools, Al-Khawarij, were the most pronounced Islamic sect that rejected the punishment of stoning because it's not mentioned in the Quran. But the majority of Muslim scholars said that the, that the well, I mean, although some of them said that it, it that it used to be mentioned, but it was abrogated, but the law itself was not abrogated. That's a larger issue. Um, if you're interested in the issue of stoning versus uh, the the hundred lashes, maybe we can get into it into Q and A. But in Surah in the Quran itself, stoning is not mentioned. It, it, Stoning is a biblical punishment. Um, if um, 
If you have the Muhammad Asad translation, read his footnote about this area because he talks about the issue of stoning and lashing. And I think Muhammad Asad is of the view that there is no, that he rejects the punishment of stoning. Um, anyway, okay. Let's move on with the surah because I don't want to get bogged down with this and come back to it if we need to. The, significantly, the only thing that is mentioned in Surah An-Nur is the hundred lashes. And it refers to as Zani was Zani, a both feminine and masculine form. And it's like underscoring as a matter of principle, if you are talking about the crime of actual zina, then as a matter of principle, if the crime is proven and there is a proper prosecution and a proper conviction, well, this is the punishment for the crime. So from the very beginning, underscoring that zina is a serious offense. It is no small matter. It is a serious infraction that God takes very seriously and that you should take seriously as well. And then this is the the at the moral plane this is further underscored by azani la yankihu illa zaniya aw mushrika wa zaniyatu la yankihu illa zanin aw mushrik wa hurrima zalika ala al mu'minin ala so this is 3 right The adulterer couples was none other than an adulteress. That is a woman who accords. Well, okay, let's leave it away. The, um, the adulterer couples was none other than an adulteress, um, and with the adulterous couples, none other than an adulterer. Now, this area gave Muslim scholars a considerable pause because is it saying that when it says the word, when it uses the word yankah, does it talk, is it talking about does yankah here mean fornicates with or has sex with or does it mean marry? Because if it means marry, then what the verse is saying is that only that then only Izani would marry Izania, or only Izania would marry Izani. So only an, an adulteress or a fornicator would marry an adulteress and a fornicator, and only a fornicator or adulteress would marry the same. Um, so, and that would have serious... And what if they're already married and one of them commits adultery? Does this mean that this dissolves a marriage? Because according to this verse, if if you ta- if you read it to mean to talk about marriage, then someone who has not fornicated or can, should not marry someone who has fornicated, and vice versa, I, I, I mean man or woman, and a woman who has not fornicated should not marry a man who has fornicated, and if they're married. What happens then? Does adultery 
dissolve the marriage automatically? Or is it saying, as Muhammad and Asad understands it, um, to that what it's really saying is that both man and woman are equally guilty when they commit adultery or fornication. That in other words, it's not primarily the man's fault or primarily the woman's fault. The they are both responsible. So it's like Muhammad Azza translates it with this understanding, within brackets, he says, both are equally guilty. The adulterer couples with none other than an adulteress, that is a woman who accords to, his, to her own lust a place side by side with God, and with the adulterous couples, none other than an adulterer, that is, a man who accords to his own lust a place side, with side, side by side with God. And that is forbidden unto the believers. So what Muhammad Asad's understanding, which by the way it mirrors the understandings of some of the earliest authorities, is that when adultery or fornication takes place, consensual adultery and fornication, both men and women are responsible, equally responsible. And that when they engage in this act, they are also engaging in an act of shirk. What is the shirk? What is the associating partners with God here? The, the, they, the association or the shirk act is their lust. That they are giving priority to their lust over their relationship with God. And God is saying, and this should not happen, that this type of engagement, that this is forbidden. Now, what we can add to this is some said, no, what this is actually saying is that it is not talking about a, a someone who fornicated but was not convicted. It is talking about people who were accused and convicted and the punishment carried out. That if you were convicted of fornication, then you should not marry except someone who has also been convicted of fornication. Yeah. This was also an early position in Islamic law that didn't survive for most. Um, and in fact, there is a report on Shoba that Ali uh, uh, um, was it? No, no, it wasn't. By, um, Uh, there is a report at, uh, uh, which um, where did I write down what is on honey? Uh, well, I didn't write down where, but the the, um, the chain. Okay. Anyway, that uh, there is a report from Abu Huraira that uh, uh, reports a hadith that لا ينكح الزان المجلود إلا مثله that if someone has been punished for zina, that they should not marry 
that part of the punishment is that they only marry someone who were, who's also convicted for the same crime. This is a hadith reported from Abu Huraira. Again, m many scholars, especially later scholars, rejected this hadith and di did not adopt that position. Um, there is a report that a man was convicted and punished for adultery and that Ali radiallahu anhu ruled that this man should be separated from his wife because of the conviction. It, however, the thing about this report is that when you delve into it and you start researching it, what arises is that the woman in some versions of the report that the woman goes to Imam Ali and says that my, after my husband has been now convicted of adultery, uh, uh, interestingly, although he's married, he's whipped, he's not stoned, which is one of the interesting things about this report. But anyway, that uh, Imam Ali then, because the wife seems to want a dissolution of the marriage, he dissolves the marriage, which is not surprising. I mean, if in fact, although, you know, th there are other issues with this report. So to, to backtrack, because I, I might have confused you a bit. So first, there are those who said that what it's talking about is that it is saying that both parties are guilty and that the shirk that it's talking about is the shirk of lust. This is one position. Another position said, no, it is talking about that if fornicate, if someone who's fornicated should not marry except someone who is also has fornicated. In other words, someone who has not fornicated should not marry someone who has not fornicated. Third position, says, no, it is not talking about whether you fornicated or did not. It is talking about whether you were convicted and punished. So if you are a convict, then you should not marry a non-convict. So these were all early three positions. The one that becomes the most, um, uh, the, the most, um, widespread in Islamic law is that it is a moral refrain that it is talking about the, the moral guilt of the couple and it is not talking about an impediment to marriage. So the majority position that eventually develops in Islamic law is to reject the argument that this is talking about that if someone is a virgin, they should only marry a virgin. And if someone is not a virgin, they should not marry um, except someone who's also not a virgin. So that position is rejected. However, there is one aspect that does deserve um, um, just a, deserves attention is that what emerges in Muslim culture, living Muslim culture, although the ayah, the majority position, became that it is talking about both parties are equally guilty, man and woman, and that there is no gender bias in the commission of this act. Note that in a lot of Muslim cultures, what develops is actually in direct controversial to this ayah. And that is if the man is not a virgin, it is not considered something shameful or embarrassing. But if the woman is not a virgin, 
that is considered shameful or embarrassing. What emerges in a lot of Muslim cultures is to get men off the hook effectively. While the clear moral import of this ayah is precisely to say that that type of discrimination is not acceptable, it's not appropriate. Okay, there is also a historical background to this verse that is worth learning about. We have numerous reports, and I try to, to, to just count them, but there, there are many, that in Medina, there was a practice that this verse was intended to address. And I'll share with you some of these reports and then explain how. Okay, so that there are reports that there were, for instance, a woman who was known as um, Umm Mahzul, who was of pr rather promiscuous, and she would um, has sexual relations with men in order so men would support her. And so she would basically look for what we today would call sugar daddies, right? No, it's like support me. And that one of the companions fell in love with this woman. And that he went, he wanted to marry her, and he asked the Prophet ﷺ about marrying her. And that, according to these reports, that this was the occasion for revealing this verse. There are um, other reports that say that it was revealed about uh, two women they, they, these reports don't mention Umm Mahzul, but they mention a woman, a woman called Marshad and another woman called Inaq, um, who similarly had, the, the story is rather, in, in, other than the, the, the fact that they're different women, but in very similar, in that Marshad and Inaq um, were promiscuous women, um, not formal prostitutes, so they, they did not like, uh, like the practice of prostitutes at the time was to raise a, 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 a red banner to advertise their, their business, but rather that they would develop boyfriend, girlfriend type relationships. And they would do so to looking for financial support. And that, again, the question arose whether, when, when there was an interest for one of the companions to marry, uh, that both, there were companions who wanted to marry both Murshid uh, uh, or Marshad and Anaq. Um, okay. Um, There are other reports that a man went to Ibn al-Abbas and told Ibn al-Abbas that I fornicated with a woman and that after fornicating with her, I wanted to marry her. But people advised me, cited this ayah, arguing that I should not marry her. Be now, it, it's odd because if you fornicated with this woman, 
then this ayah is saying a fornicator, male fornicator, marry, should marry in, or marries a female fornicator. So why is this ayah being cited to tell him you should not marry her? Anyway, anyway, Ibn al-Abbas responds that no, this is not the the ayah is not talking about whether people who slept together should marry or not marry. Rather, what the ayah was ta- was addressing, and Ibn Abbas explains, is that there were women in Medina, nasa bighaya muta'aliyat, yaj'anna ala abwabihinna rayat, ya'tihinna nas that there were women in Medina who were in the business of prostitution and that they practiced their trade openly and defiantly and that they would, in fact, advertise. They, they would put up signs so that customers would come to them and that the ayah was intended to say was intended to talk about this group of people and say that if you are a decent person, you should not marry into that pool. That's according to Ibn al-Abbas. Okay. Mujahid reports something similar, but Mujahid says... And these are all very early opinions, mind you. So it is, they're, they're important for us to understand what the earliest recipients of the Qur'an understood the Qur'an to be talking about. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that we can only understand the Qur'an that way. It just means that it is part of doing our due diligence when researching the meaning of things, right? So Mujahid explains that um, that it was common in Jahiliyyah, that it was common before Islam for women to engage in what we would call a boyfriend-girlfriend relation in order to secure financial support. And that these women would were well known that they go from one man to another according to, and they were, they were usually women who were not from, um, prestigious tribes, not from a high economic class, but that these women um, have tended to be attractive, known for their 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 craft of seduction, in other words, and. And when we came to Medina, some Muslim men, some Muslim men, fell in love with some of these women and wanted to marry them. And that they sought permission to marry in that pool. And according to Mujahid, this ayah was intended to advise them not to do so. Ibn Abbas, so now we've had um, well yeah, anyway. There's another report from Shaba that well I guess it's, I would say don't don't rush. Uh, um, okay, so maybe we'll do the Shaba the report, but in, in, anyway. So the we have a, another report, by the way, of Ibn Abbas, um, 
who explains that the, the Baraya, that the, 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 there was a class of women whose profession was prostitution, but that so much so that they would become known as Baraya al Fulan. So that what, what this reports add is that this was not a profession by class, but it was profession by clan. So that some clans were known as clans that prostituted their women. And that, so the women of these clans would be known as the prostitutes of clan and fulan or the, the, the prostitutes of this clan or the prostitutes of that clan. And that the verse was intended to say, do not marry into these clans. Okay. Let's see if uh, the report of Shaba, if it's worth, okay. That one. I hope I can find it. What's the number of the surah? 24. So let's see. But just the Arabic, it's, uh, for those who are very interested, that um, uh, this is the Mujahid report that can Rajul Yuda Mirthad, Wakat Imra Bari, Be Mecca, Yukalla Hainak, Wakana Sadiqala, Wazakra, the Kusafi Hafa, a title Rasulullah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ya Rasulullah, Ankeh Hainak. فلم يرد عليه شيء حتى نزلت الزاني لا ينكح إلا زانية. Um, and then a variant where the prophet says يا مرثا الزاني لا ينكح إلا زانية. So the, the, in this version, the um, but the the Shaba report. Yeah, it's very it's very similar that uh, um, that um, the the report that uh, uh, that there were nisa baghaya على أبوابهن رايات يأتيهن الناس يعرفنا بذلك فأنظر الله الآية that but the the uh, the reason I I, I flag this was because Shaba uh, in this report says, um, which is interesting. فقلت تزوجها فما كان فيها من إثم فعلي. So here, this is one of the naughty traditions where we are told that he tells them. So here there's a woman who um, is of ill repute and she is part of, she's one of these women who, um, uh, you know, 
has illicit relations to so that men can support her and so in this version um he says uh, the man that approaches shaba says you know i i should i i i want to marry this woman but people say that this aya uh, is telling me that i shouldn't do so and the res- the response he gets is you know go ahead and marry her and whatever sin there is from marrying her i'll 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 carry the sin you have traditions like that in the in the islamic tradition which um um i call them the naughty traditions they're a little bit rebellious they they but they they tell you that it's not you know islamic history is it's not a dogmatic um you know it's a history with bumps and real human beings with real feelings right um and who knows i mean if if it's historically accurate maybe he thought that um in this case in this particular case the woman was worth it and so he tells him you know go ahead and you know the the expression connotes that he doesn't think he he thinks that under the circumstances when 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 you find someone says something ma fiha min ism fa is that under the circumstances he doesn't really believe it's a it's a big sin that if it's an infraction it's a technical infraction so that what that tells me is that he thought this was a justified from a moral perspective a justified marriage okay so now we go back when we find so many different reports and the language itself tells us that the, the the language itself on its face the literal language connotes or tells us a clear enough message but the historical record is complicated was it talking about people convicted of the crime was it talking about people who fornicated or people who uh, engaged in illicit sex and then after doing so wanted to marry or not marry was it talk but was it talking about this complex practice of loose women or prost- women engaged in some form of prostitution or another and men who were companions of the prophet wanting to marry these women um and because that also raises another question if if in fact that is the context of this verse then is is it because they're companions that they're giving the advice don't marry these women in other words is it specific to the circumstances of the prophet and his companions or does it have normative implications beyond that when we are confronted with a complex historical picture like that we go back to the language and try to understand the language in the context of the entire surah and so remember that this is first starts out by telling us the punishment for a fornicator then it's going to move on to talk about slander and rumors 
the normal import of this ayah read in the context of the surah is imagine this whole situation was Aisha and the revelation comes and says people understand that you are going around what elicited the whole situation is rumors right slander people you go around talking about someone's reputation well I'm here to tell you this is a very serious matter because if someone is actually guilty of this crime well, the consequences are very serious because there is a very serious punishment for it. And understand that morally, when you are talking about something like this, and especially people who try to say Aisha is the, you know, try to blame Aisha, but clear Safwan. If you're talking about someone like this, you are talking about the wife of the prophet. And in God's eyes, and unless you are going to prove it, the assumption is decent people are with decent folks. Either it's one thing if you are talking about people who are known for their the people who are not a muhsan. In other words, people who are not, who don't have um, credibility because they are in fact engaged in a profession of prostitution. That's one thing. But when you are talking about a muhsan, a muhsan, someone of valid moral character, someone who's not engaged in the profession of prostitution or known to be openly promiscuous as these folks well look at the implication here by saying that she is Izania you are also impugning the character of her spouse Reread the ayah, you see. That's the clear meaning of it. The assumption is, uh, the assumption, unless proven otherwise, is of decency and upright moral character. Understand that when you talk about someone and you slander them, especially leveling this accusation, you are not just slandering them, but you are slandering who you, they are with. And as to your attempt to say that, well, because this was also, we find from the tradition, a commonly held belief that fornication occurs only because women seduce and men are entrapped. Those who said that Aisha seduced Safwan and Safwan was sort of the, the innocent lamb in this. this. This doesn't fly with God. Because right after that, it moves to, now, if you are going to engage in this type of accusation, here are the consequences. So it's clear, in my view, that the second ayah, yes, it's saying that when people fornicate or people commit unlawful, have an unlawful sexual relations, they are succumbing to their lust. And yes, they are deferring to their lust. That's the shirk part. But it's also saying that both parties would be guilty. But it's also saying, and more importantly, that before you slander someone, 
remember that this accusation doesn't just touch them, but touches them and who they are with. In other words, you are slandering the family itself. You are... um, you are dishonoring those who are partners to the objects of your slander, which is, the, and the reason I, is that this is the way Aisha reacted to the second verse. Is she, Aisha thought that it is absolute vindication for her. That one, it is, Allah rejects the idea that somehow she seduced Safwan. But more importantly, if you are impugning me, then you're impugning the Prophet. What greater vindication for Aisha than that? And that's why she, if all the reports that we have about Aisha is she was, you know, she flew to the moon with Surah al Nur. But again, it was a resounding slap in the face of those who were saying, well, we can all agree that Aisha did something that at least put her in a suspicious position. In other words, that even if we can't say that she is a fornicator, but we can say at least that she engaged in inappropriate behavior that raises very serious questions about her character. Because the second verse is actually quite sweeping. Is this clear enough? That Azani la yankihu illa zaniya. If yankih doesn't mean sex, but means in addition married to, the context of this is about Aisha. Who is Aisha married to? The Prophet. So if Allah comes, if you are saying that that Aisha did something inappropriate, then by implication, you're impugning the character of the Prophet as well. The... Aisha's sense of vindication that Allah clearly defended or Allah clearly condemned any attempt of talking about her moral character by effectively saying, this is not about Aisha. This is about much more than Aisha. This is about your your reputation, as we will see, your own honor, your own integrity as a people. Um, In the expression that... If you are going to accuse someone of inappropriate behavior, then what you're accusing is not just this person, but you are also accusing this person and their partner. That's the most simple way of putting it. 
Okay. Okay. Then we move right away from there to verse 4. That if the accusation is against a muhassana, then you either bring four witnesses to prove the accusation or those who leveled the accusation would be punished with 80 lashes. Now, of course, as several scholars noted, notice the the actual crime is punished with 100 lashes. Accusing one of the crime without proof is punished with 80 lashes, which is 80% of the, the full punishment for the crime itself. And There is a great deal that was written in in the Islamic tradition, in the jurisprudential tradition, about what is the nature of the accusation that would bring about the 80 lashes. You see, if, if it's one thing if you say the accusation that is punished with 80 lashes is an accusation of actual fornication of adultery. So someone could say, well, I'm not saying they fornicated. What I'm saying is that they're engaged in illicit behavior or they engaged in inappropriate touching or they engaged in something less than less than outright zina. And interestingly, the majority of scholars, while wrestling with the parameters of the accusation, the majority of scholars said that the punishment for qazf doesn't necessarily apply or is, doesn't, is not necessarily restricted to an accusation of full-fledged zina. But even an accusation of things that are of sexual impropriety short of zina would still bring up the punishment of slander. Now, of why did they, why did they have to do that? Because a lot of the people that were talking about Aisha didn't accuse Aisha of full fledged zina. They accused Aisha of some type of sexual impropriety. And this is you find. I mean, I'm summarizing a whole because you find a lot of debates about this in the Islamic juristic tradition. But now, especially that there are reports that the Prophet ﷺ punished Hassan ibn Sabit. Um, and this is, uh, when we get into the, I mean, the issue of evidence for this or is... Um, that, that the Prophet ﷺ, after the revelation of Surah An-Nur, punished three people for the accusation of slander. Hassan ibn Sabit, Mistah bin Athatha, the person I mentioned before, and a woman, uh, Himna bin Jahsh. And that he didn't punish Abdullah ibn Ubay or any of the hypocrites. Some said that these reports that he punished the three uh, are, is not true. So we get that out of the way. That already we have people say that, no, 
it's not true that others said that he didn't punish the hypocrites but punish these three because these three volunteered or when went up to the prophet and said this is god's law implement god's law allah alam i i i'm not sure if that's Some even said that the punishment was not 80 lashes, but something lesser than 80 lashes against these three. Um, the, the reason that, that it caused pause for Muslim jurists is that everyone agrees that none of the hypocrites were punished. But we have conflicting reports as to whether the three companions were punished. And, and that's why it became an issue in the Islamic legal tradition. Is that why would you implement the punishment against these three companions but not against the hypocrites who said far worse things and the companions who were reportedly punished were not these three specifically were not people who accused Aisha of outright zina, but of some sexual impropriety with a considerable amount of vagueness. So that also enters into the juristic debates about the crime of slander in Islamic law, whether you believe in fact that these three were punished how they were punished, what were the circumstances under they were punished, and so on and so forth. But what the majority of Muslim jurists at least agreed to is that the, it, the crime for the punishment for slander is not limited to an outright accusation of zina. So it is not going to get you off the hook to say, well, I never said zina, but I intimated sexual impropriety lesser than zina. Now, in addition to the punishment of 80 lashes, is that they lose credibility as witnesses. So they're marked as people convicted of crimes that impeach their credibility, the credibility of their character, unless, unless in Islamic law, unless they renounce and declare their repentance. So in order to regain the, your credibility after a conviction, you have to publicly apologize for the speech that led to the conviction. Okay. In my view, and I'll come back to this, but I'm going to put it in, because as we said, we're working up the pyramid. In my view, the issue in Surah An-Nur was never the 100 lashes or the 80 lashes. The issue in Surah An-Nur is, and I've talked about this before, law as an anecdote to a moral point. It is possible, yes, someone would come and confess, I've committed, I've fornicated, and I confess. Or someone would do it out in public, where carry it out in front of four witnesses. And as we all know, that the four witnesses have to, have to witness the full act. And as we know, that it is not enough for an accusation of fornication that you find two people naked in bed. That's not enough to be witnessed by four 
witnesses. It's not enough that circumstantial evidence would lead to a conclusion that there was fornication. And even the accusation of slander itself Once it became clear that if you speak about a muhassan, a muhassana first, let's start with that, that which is everyone is entitled to an assumption of hasana, meaning good character. Unless someone is an open well-known prostitute, in other words, they, they publicly advertise themselves as I am not a person who cares about my hasana, my, my immutability, my legal immunity. Then they are entitled to this assumption of hasana. And if you imply that they have engaged in sexual, or if you accuse them of engaging, of sexual, illicit sexual behavior, then you open yourself to the charge and punishment of alien lashes and the consequences of losing your credibility. Quite simply, most people would not put themselves in a situation where they would um, where they would um, where they would commit that crime and be tried and convicted of it. I mean, it, but most people immediately learned stay away from talking about the sexual conduct of people because the consequences could be extremely grave. The, the import of the revelation as repeatedly you find in, in throughout the Islamic tradition is listen, whether you are in fact convicted of it or not, the fact that you get off and, and you, don't, you're, you don't, in fact, have to suffer a hundred lashes because you're not convicted, technically, or the fact that no one ever brought a charge against you for slander, because in, throughout Islamic history, we find actually charges of slander and a successful prosecution for slander very infrequent, very infrequent. That avails you nothing in terms of the seriousness of the crime before God in the hereafter. The significance of the crime is symbolized by the graveness of the punishment, the seriousness of the punishment. The fact that you get off in this world, in fact, you are not punished in this world, is neither here nor there. Because morally, the moral infraction is extremely grave and of great consequence. And we will see that in Surah An-Nur itself, it refers to that. That, as we will see, that when, when it says that, you, you, you know, you, you say things and you don't give much... You don't put much weight on what you say. But with Allah, they are extremely grave and of great consequence. Okay, uh, let's break to pray Maghrib. I got the signal, Maghrib signal. Um, am I going too slow? Are you sure? Are you sure? Okay. Because I, I could speed it up considerably. Oh, Grace is giving me a dirty look. 
Oh, before we break from Maghreb, I, so I don't forget this. Most jurists, because I've seen some very ignorant things said on social media about this, most jurists in the Islamic legal tradition agree that the same applies to men or women. The hasana is not just for women, but it's also for men. So slandering a man or slandering a woman, accusing them of engaging in sexual impropriety, is this has the same in Islamic law. The majority of jurors said that the consequence, whether legally or morally, is the same. The eighty lashes is the same, because I, I've seen, you know, people who, of course, just shooting off their mouths. Oh, you know, the, the just does it really just, does it apply to men? Well, if if Islamic law is an indication, or the opinion of the majority of jurists is an indication, yes, it applies to men and women equally. So, and and and, and I think the evidence for it is overwhelming that it in fact does apply to men and women equally. The the other thing again, just b before we play to Maghreb, there is um, in. Um, Um, but, and by the way, Imam Shukani has a very famous treatise um, critiquing those who said that the punishment for slander only applies to, to slander of women, but not the slander of men. Um, he has a, a very famous treatise which, in which he responds to some late jurists what he means by late jurists were jurists of the 11th century hijra um, who said that it only applies to slandering women but not slandering men. Um, also, so I don't forget that early juristic authorities like uh, Zuhari, like um, uh, Sa'id ibn al-Musayyab, like Ibn Abi Layla, even said that the punishment for slander applies to slandering a Muslim or a non-Muslim. And even went further and said even slandering a kafir, accusing a kafir of sexual, if, and they have a very interesting position about why a kafir, how a kafir would be a muhassan. But that's a, a, a different matter. But that opinion, that early Islamic view by Sa'id ibn Musayyab and uh, ibn Abi Layla and so on, didn't survive in Islamic law. The majority of Muslim jurists, later jurists, said no, it only applies to Muslims, but it doesn't apply to non-Muslims. Um, um, yeah, you, you see, you, you, can, you can end, you can spend an entire lifetime on these topics because they're endlessly fascinating and you're talking about a 1,400-year-old tradition uh, with people that used their brains and used their intellects to reach positions. They were not all parrots of one another. Um, okay, anyway, let's break, break from Maghrib. Okay, Bismillah rahman rahim what time is it? 940? 940? Yeah. Um, um, Rami reminded me um, of there are reports going back to verse 3 uh, uh, there are reports and in terms of occasions for revelation there were reports that it was revealed about the, the, the reports tell you it was revealed about Ahl al and what that means 
and the sofa were the group of migrants to um, Medina who were in dire poverty. They were they were so poor that they lived basically lived in the mosque in um, in Medina and uh, whether they they had makeshift homes uh, or or homes at all i mean anyway and what these reports say is that some of al sufa they were that some of the women who were known as the promiscuous women of Medina, uh, whether they were in the official trade of prostitution or more of the sort of um, uh, searching for boyfriend, moving from one boyfriend to another uh, type scenario, uh, that they apparently approached members, particular individuals from al Sofa, from this, this group of very poor migrants, and that some of these in some of these um people wanted to marry these women because the women were would support them would basically get them out of poverty um financially support them and that the the occasion for revelation was basically to to say to them they shouldn't do that they shouldn't marry these um and what it looks like, well, that at least in the in the couple of situations that I looked into, that these women were looking to improve their social status. Interestingly, I mean, they were they. In the two occasions that that we have, they approach one of these men, whether they were attracted to them or not. We actually have one report that says that I forgot her name. That she looks, sees one of them and thinks he's very attractive, and she goes to him and she says, "You know, marry me, and I will give you a home, and I will, and I promise that if you marry me, I will." no longer uh, live the life that I um, at, at, that I um, been engaged in. In other words, I, I won't continue um, in uh, and it seems from what I could gather is that these women saw an opportunity for upward mobility by offering to proposing effectively to uh, marry members of al Sufa and to actually support them. And what they would get from this is social status. Um, uh, now whether Allah Alam, because you, again, you get um, uh, uh, the the oh and the the report where um um the um, um the report where Mujahid reportedly says you know go ahead and marry her and uh, the it's Muhalay and I'll I'll carry the sin for it or you know the sin of the act will be on me. Uh, it reportedly takes place on one such occasion is that the 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 woman says i'll marry you i'll support you and um 
I will refrain from living in this lifestyle. And uh, he goes and he asks Mujahid, and Mujahid says, well, you know, um, and he says, well, but people told me this ayah prohibits me from marrying her. And Mujahid says, well, no, go ahead and marry her, and if there's a sin, I'll bear it. I'll carry it. And that that um, Mujahid saw in the balance of things that it, it sh the marriage should go forward. I want to underscore, and this maybe will become clear as we go on with Surah An-Nur, that I think, I mean, I do think that it, you can't have all these reports about uh, women of the trade and the possibility of a marriage. What's interesting about the, the woman of the trade marrying a companion narratives is that they're all, all the narratives involve companions who were muhajirun, who were migrants, not Medinian natives, not Ansar. Um, which any good historian would immediately suspect um, that there is either loneliness or financial circumstances. That because they're all migrants, they're all annual aliens to society. And all the men that in which we had reports, similar reports like that about them, were all migrants who were not married. Or some of them, there are a couple of them who were reportedly married, but their wives didn't convert and remained back in Mecca. And so they were no longer married in Medina. And this... And I don't see, I mean, all the reports also doesn't tell us that th this verse comes as saying, giving them a strict prohibition. It is that even the reports that say that the verse apply to the situations, but rather it, that it advises them not to engage not not to go down that road and you can i mean you can imagine why um it would be if for people who had migrated from mecca who were uprooted um having a many of them were in in uh, serious um, financial difficulty, uh, and especially that I think that Surat al Nur was before before Surat al Hashr, and all the, the 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 challenges that they that they would meet, it, it would be quite tempting to sort of find a fix for their social problems uh, by convincing themselves, well, we'll marry from this class and we will reform these women. We will be these women's saviors. But I don't think the power dynamic was that, in fact, they, I mean, these, these women seem to have been quite established in Medinian societies so established that they continued to practice their profession long after the hijra. Um, and some of them, even there is evidence that they continue to be practicing, they continue to practice their profession or to have their, their, their houses of ill repute even uh, until the Prophet ﷺ dies. Um, so, and there, there is something in, in in this in that in this power dynamic. There is a story that is not fully understood here, 
um, I mean, it's. It, I suspect just the sniff test, if you will, is that it's not an appropriate way to deal with your problems. Uh, to marry into um, money, basically, to marry into a woman who's going to solve your financial problems and you tell yourself, well, you know, and I'll change her, that's not a, a good way to go about things. Um, and that it doesn't surprise me that the advice they get is, you know, while it's not a strict prohibition, because some of these marriages did go through, um, and they didn't go well, by the way. Um, but and if it was a strict prohibition, none of them would, none of these marriages would have gone through. But um, that they would get basically the advice that no, you know, this is not an appropriate way to solve your problems. Aside from the historical, because we could get we, the, the historical circumstance, because again, I'm responding to some questions I got during the, the break. My view is that the language of the, of the verse itself, and we will, this will become clear as we go through the, the surah, is that it is saying, A, The idea that you can say, because in fact, as I said, that some, and, and by the way, this, this view continues to live even in Tafasir written centuries after the fact, that fornication is basically the fault of women, that no fornication occurs without the seduction of women, sort of like men are the innocent lambs in, in, in Zina. This verse completely eradicates that notion. That, you know, Zina, both parties at, are equally at fault. The other part is that which, because of the Aisha situation, is that an accusation that you level against a muhassan, against someone who is entitled to the presumption of immunity, of, of moral character, because they haven't, they, they haven't done anything to, to compromise the, the assumption of good moral character, which all Muslims are entitled to as a matter of ethical presumption, um, is that the accusation touches them and, and anyone that is part of the fabric of their family. If you tell me what, what proof do you have of this, all I can tell you is that Aisha's reaction in saying, when you accused me, you also accused the prophet, is that what gives me that. There is another thing to verse number, to, to, to the verse three, which um, I didn't mention, um, but I remember during the prayer is that, no, look, it comes right between the punishment for zina and the punishment for slander. I started out saying this and then I forgot and, uh, and then I remembered again, so it's a good thing I remembered. Now, what, if you read it in the context of where it occurs, the punishment for zina and the punishment for slander, and you take the plain language of what the plain language is saying, it is clearly talking about a situation of consensual sex. 
it's like saying, if there is consensual sex, then male and female are both fornicators. Now, but and this this point I can't I don't claim it's in the tafsir. This is my point, and Allahu Alam, God knows best. But what if it's not consensual sex? Reread verse three. Reread it again, and again. Because it's like saying what I'm telling you about zina and what I'm telling you about slander, the doesn't apply to claims of coerced sex. This is to me a very clear and plain import. Zani and is Zani Zani la yankahu illa Zaniya wa Zaniya la tankahu illa Zani. Here the assumption is what? Consensual. And so what we said about the law of zina and what we say about the law of slander, it's in situations where we are talking about claims of consensual sex. But if it's not consensual sex, then it's a completely different situation. And that is precisely why jurists who pondered, although not particularly in the, in the context of this area, but said, well, when we talk about non-consensual sex, what applies here is the law of haraba and not the law of zina. Because we enter into a different paradigm. So some a lot of times you get people say, well, oh, claims of sexual harassment or claims of rape. And they, they say, they try to apply the uh, had uh, a cause. Oh, you know, you, you can't talk about it because otherwise, unless you bring four witnesses, then 80 lashes. No, it doesn't apply because verse 3 makes us understand that we are talking about consensual sex. But if the claim is about coercion, duress, then we are in a different category and in a different paradigm. I hope as we go through Surah An-Nur that this will become clear because you'll see the emphasis of Surah An-Nur. As I said, as the pyramid rises and Allah brings us closer and closer to the moral point of Surah An-Nur, we are still, we're going on the ascending steep of that pyramid. You'll see where the emphasis of Surah An-Nur, where, where, where the, the, the majority of the stress is. What it underscores as the main thrust of God's message. And 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 then we'll 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 talk about and why that moral message in the historical circumstance that Muslims were going through at the time. Okay. So Right after that, right after zina, equal responsibility and voluntarism and cause slander, we get to accusations between married couple. And here again, the realm of transmissions reported transmissions is endlessly fascinating. This is for um, uh, 
summarize, uh, well, I'm not jumping, I'm not skipping anything, but a, a summary, I think, is, is appropriate. Um, that there are in, in numerous reports, most of them go revolve around a man called Hilal ibn Umayyah. Um, with different versions of the reports. And some of the reports revolve around a figure nor, uh, known as Uwaymir. But, okay, so the gist of these reports, and let me see if... Um, Maybe Uh, okay, well, uh, I'll, I'll summarize. Anyway. Okay, so, um, Hilal bin Umayyah once has a problem. He In different versions, he either witnesses, um, and the Uwaymir story is also quite similar in, in this, is that he either witnesses a man lying with his wife, um, and both of them in a, in a very compromising position, or uh, he suspects a man with his wife. But in either case, depending on the version, he goes to the Prophet ﷺ and he says, okay, if one of us, you know, I, I see my wife in bed with a man, and if I run to go get four witnesses, they'll be done with whatever they're doing. And, you know, by the time I get my four witnesses, there'll be nothing. They're done. And if I lose my temper and I kill the man or I kill my wife, you'll execute me that if I killed someone, you're going to kill me. And if I say anything about what I witnessed, you'll flog me. And so he, the, the narratives of Hilal ibn Umayyah and, uh, and Umayyah narratives are similar but different in some critical respects. But anyway, is that the dilemma, right? Is that if, if I... If I sort of do an honor killing, you're going to punish me because in Islamic law, there's no... The, by the way, the, the mitigation for honor killings is from French law. It's not Islamic law. Um, anyway. The frustrations of, 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 of... The frustrations with ignorance are just really... Anyway. Um... The, the law of mitigation in, in, in a, in a uh, you know, uh, an excited mental capacity is, it's from the importation of French law. Uh, in Islamic law, if you, if uh, any such killing would be just murder, it wouldn't be, um, 
Anyway, so the Hilal ibn Umayya narratives uh, and Awaymer narratives are also very similar. Is that you know if I if I commit a crime, I'm going to be punished for it. If I go get witnesses, then basically it's all done by then. And if I say anything, you'll punish me. And in some of these narratives, he goes to the Prophet والسلام, and he is complaining, he's telling the Prophet, okay, I, instead of saying, I want to tell you what I saw my wife doing, but I can't say it, because if, if I, I say the words, you're going to say, okay, where are your four witnesses? I don't have four witnesses, you're going to flog me. And that the Prophet والسلام, keeps turning away from him. It's like, you know, it's like, hey, dude, you know, I don't want to punish you. I don't want to flog you. So go away. Stop talking. Because if you say the wrong words and you end up accusing your wife, you don't have four witnesses. So it keeps turning away from him. And that he, Hilal ibn Umayya gets very frustrated. And he says, you know, I, I'm going to complain to God. That these are in several, you know, I, I'm going to take my my case to God, sort of, and that the revelation. Now, of course, I I have probably the theater of these narratives, which quite often have the telltale of medieval way of telling stories, um, is an exaggeration, but. The probably ex describing some actual historical issue, and the historical issues is accusations between married couples, um, where the accusations of infidelity, and where. Typically, in accusations of such infidelity, you're not going to have four witnesses. Um, and the law of slander um, would have a chilling effect on bringing bringing uh, you know to to, to or, or bringing forward a serious problem with a marriage like that infidelity in the marriage and i think that these these historical events were actually not the occasion for a revelation i think they were they were told after the revelation in other words these historical stories about Hilal ibn, um, Hilal ibn Umayyah and so on, that there were, were the verse applied to historical events that took place after the revelation, not before the revelation. Anyway, and so when it comes to married couples, Surah Al-Nur has a clear approach that reminds us of Surah An-Nisa that the practice with married couples when there's an accusation of infidelity is a procedure known as li'an so the accuser will With the accuser will swear by four, four times, and if if four an oath that is repeated four times, that what they are accusing their spouse of is the truth, and and the fifth oath that may Allah curse them if they are lying. 
this shifts the burden of proof to the defendant. And the defendant then can rebut the, the accusation, can rebut this burden of proof by in turn taking an oath four times that they are in fact saying the truth and that whoever is accusing them is lying and that the first oath is that may Allah curse them if they are lying. There is a, um, a narrative, again, evidence that that the Hulal ibn Umayyah story was not an occasion of revelation, but in fact, whatever happened with Hulal ibn Umayyah, it happened after the revelation, is that we are told that Hulal ibn Umayyah, in fact, engages in Ilan with his wife. Um, and Hilal says that he saw he saw the, 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 the man, the, his wife lying with this man, and that his wife swears four times that he is lying and she's saying the truth, and she comes to the fifth time, the fifth oath, where now she says, and may God curse me if I am lying. Um, and she pauses. And then after pausing, and she seemed to hesitate, she goes ahead and takes the fifth oath. And according to some traditions, some versions of this tradition, the, the prophet comments, uh, not to Hillel, but to some of the companions close to him, that he knows that she was lying. But that she, that's, you know, since she's taken the oath, there's no recourse against her. Um, the Li'an automatically dissolves the marriage. So that process, that procedure, automatically dissolves the marriage. And there is... It, it is a foolproof procedure. It is taking this falsely swearing this oath, falsely engaging in the process of Le'an is like uh, getting a, a one-way ticket to hell. You, you've pretty much taken the type of oath that there's no going back from. And the Islamic tradition is full of stories, morality tales about people who, the, the tales often say uh, about people who took the oath in, 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 in um, falsely took the oath and that the consequences on this earth even before the hereafter were disastrous. So the, the, the tales, I mean, and they're, they're, not, they're not found in books on law. They're often found in books on theology, they're books on mawais, uh, books in raqa'iq, um, that tell you stories about such and such man who, uh, you know, falsely took the, the, the oath or such and such woman who falsely took the oath and what God did to them. Um, you know, the, the tales are usually the losing their eyesight, um, getting a, a disease that cripples them, uh, losing all their wealth, uh, getting a horrible skin disease. Um, it, it just, it, again, another part of our tradition that is unfortunately lost in my view. So, so now we have the procedure 
the punishment for zina itself, the hundred lashes. We have slander. We have such accusations in the context of a marriage. Importantly, it is the if a husband or if a wife either accuses their spouse of infidelity but refuses to engage in lahan in classical islamic law that's a that's an offense a felony punishable by tazir that to so if you for instance say my wife is unfaithful and you, ref- you you just go around saying it to her family and or to your friends but you are not bringing a procedure of lian you're just going around saying it that's an actionable charge and anyone that well in islamic law there is this, this is a big point who has the standing to bring the charge against you? Most jurists said the family of the wife, so a brother, a father, an uncle who hears it, or the wife herself, obviously, can bring an action against you to punish you either with jail or with flogging for... Now, there are jurists who said that if convicted of such a charge, then the judge must compel an action of li'an. So once, what that means, because modern Muslims are a mess, you know, they're, they're just, that once you utter that accusation and it is proven against you that you've actually uttered that accusation, then a judge will compel you to go through the process of the an, which necessarily means a dissolution of your marriage. Which meant that unless you are you want your marriage dissolved, or you want to end up being punished for effectively slandering your spouse you had to watch what you're saying. Because in modern Muslim societies where you see people just casually throwing around stuff like that, they don't realize that in the opinion of so many scholars, the mere accusation if that the, the accused has the right to demand a process of li'an and that that automatically dissolves your marriage. So it puts you in an extremely morally suspect position with your Lord. Okay. What time is it? 10.20. Okay, so we're going to stop in, in a second. Um, I'm going to stop with verse 10. وَلَوْلَا فَضْلُ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكُمْ وَرَحْمَتُهُ وَأَنَّ اللَّهَ تَوَّابٌ حَكِيمٌ Muhammad Asa translates it, and were it not for God's favor upon you, and God's grace, and that God is a wise acceptor of repentance. The reason I flag verse 10 is that Surah An-Nur is, this is a, in, in the revving up to, in the, this pyramid structure in which Allah it reminds us, gives us indications that this legislation, 
this ordering of things is Allah saving us from our own follies. That in the same way that you should be serious about zina, but it is not just a matter of being serious about zina and, and stopping there, but you should also be extremely serious about accusations of sexual impropriety and slander. That this is equally grave, and you'll see why all of this is important, because all of this connects, it's, it's all connected with one another, like, like a single structure. But, and that accusations of sexual impropriety, in Surah An-Nisa, we dealt with fahisha, accusations of short of zina, you are not accusing someone of um, fornication or adultery, but you are accusing someone of sexual impropriety, short of cheating. Now, in Surah An-Nur, we move from fahisha to more serious accusations. And that it is so serious that it will dissolve your marriage, it will in- imperil your soul on this earth and in the hereafter. These accusations cannot be taken lightly because the consequences with God are not light. As some commentators have said, that if a truly pious person would find it a lighter matter to be flogged a hundred times than to risk putting, than the risk a, a God cursing their soul in this earth, earth and the hereafter, that it is a more serious matter. And then Allah comes and says, people reflect, this is all for your own good, and as you will see, regardless of what social pressures you think you are going through. Because you can't separate these issues. The fact that you're going through a tough time, as we will see, doesn't give you license to go at one another in the way that the example of what happened with Aisha demonstrated to us. Okay, let, let's stop here. Uh, obviously, we're not, we're just verse 10. So, we're, you know, my initial optimism about finishing Surah Al-Nur in one halaqa is, as usual, highly unrealistic. It's like my five-minute breaks, you know. It's, <laughs> it's all the same logic. Alhamdulillah. Thank you so much for not rushing and taking your time. <laughs> this was really amazing. Alhamdulillah. Um, be, I know we had last time thought that what we would do um, was start a new surah, or finish a new surah, um, and then combine the Q&A for Surah Hash and whatever the surah would be. Obviously, we're going to be engaging. We didn't know we were going to get Surah I know. <laughs> so I it's mean... going to be a little while before we get to the Q&A. But before we got too far, actually, um, we were uh, wanting to ask, or at least some of us were talking, or Sharif and I were talking, um, if you could please just tell us what the vicar was for Surah Hesh before we forget to ask you. And, and I'll, I'll ask you again when we get oh, to okay. the Q&A. But, um, Can you remind me next halakha? Because okay. Yeah, I'm, yeah. You don't remember? Or no, I, I, I remember. I, it just... Okay, you're in yeah. Sornor, in the zone for Sornor. Okay, yeah. so <laughs> um, we, we just don't want to lose the, the vicar for Sora Hash. But also in the meantime, um, if you guys have questions, write them down for Sora Hash and also for Sornor. So by the time we get to the Q&A that, you know, we, we haven't lost anything. So um, thank you everyone so much for being with us for this really wonderful occasion. Thank you so much, Sheikh, for this amazing start to, um, to Sora Noor. Um, truly, truly mind-blowing as always um and everyone have a wonderful week and inshallah we will look forward to seeing you next week okay assalamualaikum